Coinbase is suing the SEC, or as David Woo! would say, we are suing the we, SEC. We're suing the SEC. <laughs> Bankless Nation, it is the last Friday of April, 2023. What time is it, David? Uh, it's the Bankless Friday weekly roll-up where we cover the entire weekly news in crypto, which is always just an ambitious endeavor. We got some lawsuits to talk about. <laughs> this time in our favor, we're the ones doing the suing. Feels good, man. Uh, but uh, in order to prepare for all of that content, make sure that you have your morning coffee. You got your coffee, Ryan? Uh, you I totally You're going to need it. Yep. Uh, also, we should clarify: it's not you and I suing anybody. At least. Not oh yeah, we're, we 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 as the crypto industry are doing we the, the suing. We the people <laughs> yeah. are suing the powers that be. This is Coinbase <laughs> suing the SEC. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's taking a while to get. I guess I, I guess I should just say that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that. Also, uh, John Oliver, he's got some mm -hmm. fighting words for crypto. Well, I think I you know it's mostly fair coverage. We're going to talk about this. I think it was the mainstream take though. We'll talk about what that means, David. What else are we? Covering. Uh, authorities are looking into SBF's parents. So SBF, the Bankman Freed name back in the menu today. Uh, but then, of course, we're going to get back into our roots, talk about Chappella two weeks forward, uh, some more Rocket Pool stats, uh, and something on Solana I think is cool. So we'll talk about that huh. as well. Yeah, go figure. Is it a phone, David? It's not a phone. It's not the It's phone. a backpack. It might be it's a backpack. It's not the backpack. <laughs> All right. I don't well, know we'll what the backpack out. is. <laughs> to be continued. Uh, guys, and of course, if you like Bankless and if you like crypto, make sure you like and subscribe, rate and review. That's how we pop to the top of the charts. We want to get the top of the charts in Spotify and YouTube and any other charts that exist. We want to get the crypto message out there. Uh, David, see how before much we... an AI Ryan is. Like, if that's yeah. a chart, I want to be there. <laughs> it's a chart. Let's, let's optimize. Um, <laughs> Speaking of this, speaking of optimization, the Safe Wallet wants you to know about account abstraction, which is an optimization that they are working on. So Safe, of course, used to be called Gnosis Safe. It's now called Safe. It's the multi-sig that everybody in Ethereum uses, including mm -hmm. Bankless. Um, you've heard us talking about account abstraction before as well. Account abstraction is kind of the new smart contract wallet that is going to put fintech user experience to shame. And now SAFE has something they are rolling out, a way for you to tap into their account abstraction. David, tell them about this SDK. Uh, so if you are a developer, and like we all know, have been chanting on Bankless, we are in the paradigm of externally owned accounts. It's a terrible name. Uh, <laughs> they're called private keys. We know 99% of wallets are private key externally owned account wallets. Eventually, in the future, 99% of wallets will be ex account abstraction, all, also a bad name, uh, smart contract wallets. And Gnosis Safe, also called Safe, is helping us get there with this SDK for developers to build more smart contract wallets so that we can fix all of crypto's goddamn terrible UX problems. <laughs> and so Safe and their Safe Core account abstraction software development kit, devs, Named stuff so weird, <laughs> uh, but they've got a, they've got a dev package for all the devs out there. Uh, so it's, it helps you build on ramps, it helps you build your protocol, it helps you build uh, relays for gasless transactions and meta transactions. It, it's got a little plugin for your fiat on ramps because you're going to need to get money into your wallet. Uh, and so if you are building in the world of account abstraction, if you're building a smart contract wallet, or you need something like this for your Web three game or whatnot, uh, the core SDK which is available in the link in the show notes, is for you. And also, there's a hackathon going on on Monday. This is Monday, mm -hmm. May, May, 1st. May 1st. So if the dev stuff didn't appeal to you, this is a hackathon for everybody. They call it uh, an anything goes hackathon. An a, a anything, it's really hard to explain. The word anything, but with two A's, and they're both capitalized, because <laughs> it's an account abstraction hackathon, but anything goes. So anything goes, if you're non Tech. If you're a non-developer, you can do stuff just like um, yeah, explain a project. Uh, you can do the, the marketing, the presentation. You can make memes. Anything goes hackathon. So it's literally like everything else is non-technical. I love um, these. Also, a great way to hackathons. start and get on a team and to get some practice and, and sharpen your sticks in the uh, Web three world. Yeah, more inclusive hackathons. That's uh, that's cool. I hope this trend continues. Uh, David, let's get to the market. Speaking of trends and whether they're continuing or not, got to start nice. with uh, the Bitcoin price. Today, are we continuing the trend up, down, or flat? Dude, uh, crypto prices were super weird this week. Net flat, net, net flat, flat on the week. 
Okay. Uh, so Bitcoin is down 0.33%. So it's flat. Uh, we are currently at $29,000. Almost touched $30,000. Almost broke below $27,000, but here we are at the end of the week flat. But I will remind Bankless Sister, you should probably just pull open your phone and check the price right now because I don't know what it's going to be like (laughs) in 24 hours. (laughs) Well, speaking of which, uh, before you do pull out the phone, let's talk about the ETH price at the time of recording. Did that do similar things to Bitcoin flat on the week? Uh, slightly down, but it's it's flat. It's it, Ether went down two percent this week. Um, it's you know what's it's really flat. funny. It's flat. Do you, do you see these red candles? You see them yeah. both on the Bitcoin chart right. yeah, and yeah, the yeah. Uh, Ethereum chart. Yeah. This so, happened okay, so while we had we a pump. So, so uh, yeah, the, the red candle happened while we were recording with Ledger. Ether pumped from eighteen hundred almost up to two thousand, and we were like. We're back, baby. Uh, same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin almost it like hit thirty thousand and it bounced off of it, and then like five hours later, everything dumps back down. Ether goes from almost two thousand down to eighteen hundred. Bitcoin goes from thirty thousand down to twenty seven hundred twenty seven thousand, and now we're back right in the middle of those two things. So, Ryan, what the hell happened? <laughs> well, this was happening, by the way, during. We don't usually do shows on just prices and just right. charts, but we did a show on just prices and just charts. And this is the candle we experienced during that show. Right. Do, do you uh-huh. see that like talk on Twitter? People were blaming the thumbnail of that yeah. show as yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It's like a big goofy a picture of like Ledger with his like with, mouth with open. With only scared. words, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> that, that one might have been our fault. But that it, that wasn't the case. So uh I don't I don't think we can be blamed for this, at least, David. There was I don't news think be breaking during the show. Mount Gox and the US government, while it's making trans transactions the right. infamous original mount gox wallets that were supposed to be sort of locked up maybe doing things maybe causing a sell off this news sort of propagated it turns right. so, out okay, david so the, the mount so here the tldr of mount gox is that there has been a t- decent amount of bitcoin something like 10 to 20% of the supply of the mount gox hacks hack bitcoins that has been locked up in the court proceedings because some of forever. the forever Go- forever because some people keep on delaying and delaying and delaying i don't know the, why the strategy is behind yeah. that Anyways, the the Mount Gox Bitcoin unlock FUD has been with us since I've been in crypto. Like, oh yeah, it's like the, the that meme of like the truck running into the wall, but the camera cuts every single time. It's been <laughs> it like that for happens. like four four years, uh, and That's so exactly the news broke like. that a Mount Gox wallet actually started sending transactions, implying that the FUD has finally arrived. The, the, the truck is finally going to crash into the wall. Uh, and so uh, an alert, uh, like a bot alert, alert about like, hey, this wallet's making transactions went out, which is yep. what triggered this tweet from DB, who does all of these breaking tweets saying, Mount Gox, Mount Gox wallets are moving. They're going to sell. They're going to sell. The implication is that like the 10 to 20% of the Mount Gox exploited uh, Bitcoins are basically going to be sold because they were market. right because they were one thousand to they they were like three hundred to one thousand dollars at the time of purchase and now it's yeah. whatever the price it is now thirty thousand dollars so you're going to assume that these people are finally going to liquidate that that like almost decade long force hold so that's the story yes. and then these things f- actually start moving on chain to set off this alert this Arkham alert which triggers this tweet which forces the market to sell off. That was all that backstory. Turns out <laughs> it was an errant bug. So once again, the truck did not crash into the wall. So uh, turns out we just totally wasted your time by telling yes. you this. Just like that the markets the wasted our time <laughs> yes, in like the story. producing this errant signal. I, I, I feel like this is a bigger picture of the markets right now, David, which is like no one really knows what to do. And so there's all of this noise. Right. This is just more noise. Yeah, People more asking noise. like why the price up and down. Well, it was a false alert, but now it's mm-hmm. kind of stayed down at least from the highs, but like it, it bounced so like much, a little bit. But, there's yeah. so much noise in this kind of market and I just kind of filtered out and I'm just uh, I'm just done with it. I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> How about the ratio? You done on the ratio? ETH Bitcoin I'm ratio. I'm also done with the ratio. <laughs> okay, cuz it's going down. Uh, it's 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 at 0. 0.065, so like downer ish, but it's still within the, the last range it's been in the last 2 years. Nothing thought, is significant like, below until we get start to get below like 0. 0.055. Ledger or above 0. 0.8, 0.08. Ledger had good commentary on the ratio, I think. Yeah, he did. Um, that was a really good episode. People should go watch that. Did it change your mind at all? Are you still holding the ratio for uh, you know? Well, yeah, because like, because he was like, Dave, like David, if like you know, Bitcoin goes Bitcoin Hulk mode, and uh, Bitcoin's at a hundred thousand dollars, and Ether's only at five thousand dollars. That is a ratio of like point. I'm gonna catch you the math. It was something like point zero five or something. 
And I'm like, well, that's, I held that my, my ratio trade built down to the three hours capital liquidation when it got down to 0.04 or something. So like, not scared. come at me, bro. Like I'm not scared. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, ETH, ETH is a different ETH than the last bear market. And that was right. the main thrust of yeah. Ledger's argument. Last bear market, it was weak. It was so, so weak, weak in so comparison weak. to Bitcoin. We, yeah. We've got a much stronger ETH this time around. Uh, global crypto market cap. I'm going to say it this time, David, because it's so uninteresting. Oh, you're taking it from me two weeks in a row. Well, We're right? above a trillion, 1.24 oh, trillion. We are. <laughs> that's, that's what you need to know. <laughs> Tell us about this story, though. Cumulative ETH deposited with Beacon Chain and Validator. Should we shook the snow globe? What's mm-hmm. happening with all the, the ETH that was staked? Is it being unstaked? Is it staking elsewhere? What's going on? Uh, so I've become a connoisseur of Chappella metrics, dashboards, et cetera. This dash, this particular dashboard Very from the fancy. block, I think is is the best one to okay. illustrate the Chappella snow globe. So this is the ether supply deposited into the beacon chain since the launch of the beacon chain in December of 2020, and of course the chart is up only the entire time up until the Chappella uh, withdrawal fork that happened uh, two weeks ago. And so the line is literally cannot go down up until two weeks ago. And then the withdrawals happened. And this was like, though, the withdrawals are coming. The withdrawals are coming. Everyone's going to withdraw. And you can see you can see the first moment that this line goes down at the teeny little top right there. <laughs> and it goes from a whopping 18 point something million uh, Ether uh, stakes down to like 17.7, 17. 17.5 17. Uh, million Ether staked. And we have continued on the same uptrend that we've been on since December of 2020. Uh, withdrawals seem to have uh, slowed down uh, and deposits have continued. Uh, and so the withdrawals seem to be over two weeks. David, I, I want to take you back down uh, memory lane, Crypto Grandpa. Do you remember when it was, we were worried, the Ethereum right. community is worried about getting 500K ETH right. staked? Because we, we needed 500K to, to kickstart the beacon chain and, and like we weren't necessarily getting Are we there. Are going to get it? Look, we're look at this. It. That's way back here. Yeah. 500K ETH. <laughs> We and it. now we we're talking it. about like just 18 a, you million, know, yeah. yeah, 18 million. 500 K ETH got withdrawn and that is a blip. Yeah. It's just a blip. Uh, what about this? Another dashboard for, for the fine connoisseur of dashboarding mm-hmm. that you are. How do you rate this Hill Dobby dashboard? What can we take away from uh, ETH staking here? This Hill Dobby dashboard is a, a top tier, very fine, okay. very fine okay. dashboard. It's very, very nice. Fine. Um, <laughs> uh, we are net inflows since the Shanghai Chappella hard fork, a negative 440,000 ether in the deposit in the beacon chain. So that is the number of ether that has been net withdrawn. That used to be lower. I think it was as low as something like 0.7 million. Now we're at 0.44 million. Um, the total supply of ether on the beacon chain, 18.7 million. Uh, and, uh, the, actually the cool parts about this thing, if you go to, uh, scroll down a little bit further, so stakers, del- the delta of stakers in the last month, uh, so you can filter that, Ryan, by uh, market share. Uh, and so you can see who's won and who's lost in the last like month or so by clicking on the market share word. Uh, that's in the last week, but go over to the one, go over to the month because it's been more of uh, more than one week. Uh, so Kraken, obviously the big loser because of uh, uh, lost all their stake teeth because the Gary Gensler forced them to. Um, but even Coinbase, uh, who was unforced, also is a net loss of Ether, uh, net net outflows of Ether. Uh, Huobi, um, Gemini, decentralized exchanges. Uh, now, if you click that one again, we, we will see who the winners are. So the, the market share increase, if you order by who has won the most the, of the snow globe. So where has all that snow landed, that good old Ether? Uh, unidentified is the winner here at 1.5% growth in market share, which is big, by the way. Who's identified? Unidentified. Who is that, Ryan? It's probably a lot of solo stakers. Right. They're identified because they're solo stakers. Those are the many people. At 1.5%. Coming in second is staked.us. I think that is um, staked-wise. Coming in second at, uh, they gained 0.6% market share. Stakefish, uh, P2P, OKX, followed by Rocket Pool at 0.2%. Uh, and so that is the winners and, and the losers. Pretty cool. So the snow globe is happening uh, to some to some extent, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, what's really interesting is this is just a blip off of the high. Do you, do you think we've bottomed already, David, on the, the oh, withdrawal yeah. I think to we deposit bottomed. ratio? I think we bottomed. Yep. Call wow. them, I'm famous for calling bottom for calling bottoms. Uh, call them the bottom. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you. It's yeah. both David and Ryan calling the bottom. Oh, so you know it can't. That be doesn't happen often. Two, two two bankless hosts calling the bottom right now. It's gotta be the, the other bottom. thing that's worth noting actually is that Lido has not yet enabled withdrawals. They uh, had like two they have had like two or three more weeks. I think it's at the end of May 
when they, yeah. uh, so like they still have their snow globe moment. And honestly, like when you're in the lead of the staking derivatives and you're like taking your time to like enable withdrawals, like, yeah, I bet you guys would take your time to enable <laughs> withdrawals. <laughs> I, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't have called the bottom just now because who knows what could happen with the uh, Lido. That's a pretty... Uh, I, well, I, don't, I wouldn't be share. too worried about that because uh, you can always exit as a Lido person with stake teeth. Um, and so there is an exit route. Um, it, but yeah, there will be some pent up demand. Uh, Lido has definitely got a lot of net inflows. Uh, but that's because they're, they're, it's kind of unfair because they literally don't allow outflows. So it's, it's still in only for Lido. You know, it's a market piece I really enjoyed this week was uh, a piece by Polenia who is a, an L2 researcher in general, uh, pseudonymous, had them on the Bankless podcast before, and they do a quick tour of the top five chains by economic activity. This is a post I think is worth reading. We'll include a link to it in the show notes, but I'll, I'll go through the kind of the breakdown. Number one, top chain by economic activity. I'm it's got to be, of course, you know it, Ethereum oh, at number God. one by a lot. Okay, oh, Ethereum God. secures I was 420 worried. billion <laughs> across ETH, ERC-20s, and NFTs. Plenty goes through different dimensions to kind of judge both passive and active economic activity. And uh, Ethereum is in the lead on both, both passive and active. Of course, it's far in the lead over over the number two, which is Bitcoin on active. And, and number two, indeed, is Bitcoin. After that, Plenia mentions this very large gap, this very large delta. Tail. Yeah, there's like, it's a two-horse race, basically, um, with Ethereum leading um, by a lot on the active side on economic activity. But then after that, you get into Arbitrum. It's number three on Plenia's list, followed by Tron and Binance Smart Chain. What's interesting is if you have been mostly absorbing bankless content, right? We don't talk much about the Tron story, do we? We mm -hmm. don't talk about much about the Binance Smart Chain story. The reason no. we don't is because We're these are like- We're maxis. Well- <laughs> We're biased decentralization maxis, I'm, I'm totally and I kidding. totally will admit that. Like, I, I, I am a biased decentralization maxi. Right, like, yeah. I can't. Like, both of us are. Right. And so, uh, but Tron is doing a lot of activity, and it's somewhere in the spectrum of like, is it sort of a bank? Is it fintech? Right. Or is it crypto? Is it an open banking system? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, it's doing a lot with uh, Tether right now. Mm -hmm. Binance mm -hmm. Smart Chain as well. So if you talk to um, people in Argentina right now, and what crypto are they actually using? It's like stable coins on Tron and Binance Smart mm -hmm. Chain. That's what's happening. And that usage, that I think, is- Tron has great adoption in financially underserved parts of the world. I think it's great. As I'm a not mad network. about this. It's more private keys in the hands of more people. Yep. Um, hopefully it doesn't rug everyone at some point, but it's got some rug resistance in it. Not a lot, yep. a little bit. It's got some more it's got than a maybe a amount of Lindy, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of cool. Anyway, that's uh, the he does down. he does follow up. Excuse me. They they also follow up saying that the once dominant number two player Binance Smart Chain and also Tron has been dethroned by Arbitrum One this last bear market. Ooh. If the YouTube viewers are confused about the tweet that was on screen that didn't go by the list that uh, Ryan and I just said, that's because Polenia elaborates further on about his reasoning. Their reasoning. Oh yeah, yeah. I shown a faulty tweet. All right, yeah. David. What do we got coming up next? Coming up next, Coinbase suing the SEC. That's us, I claim. <laughs> uh, and a public response, an interesting strategy. They're posting the, their response to the SEC, both as a written letter, because that's what you do, and a YouTube video, taking a leaf out of Influencer Gary's book. So we're going to watch <laughs> a clip out of that, uh, that YouTube video. Uh, and we'll also take a peek, Ryan, at so a case study of some character development, if you will, of a pre-SEC Gary Gensler, at MIT, giving some takes. So we're going to watch some clips. Uh, been we've been clip heavy on the weekly roll up in the last uh, couple of weeks. I like clips, and that continues. Speaking of clips, John Oliver got some John Oliver <laughs> clips as well, uh, and he's got some uh, takes for crypto as well for the mainstream. So we're going to play all those clips and talk about them and all that stuff as soon as we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors, especially Kraken, our strategic sponsor for 2023, the one that we always look at when we look at prices earlier in the show. So thank you, Kraken, for helping us look at these prices, and let's go hear from Kraken right now. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading 
trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. If you haven't yet experienced the superpowers that a smart contract wallet gives you, check out Ambire. Ambire works with all the EVM chains, the layer twos like Arbitrum, Optimism, and Polygon, but also the non-Ethereum ecosystems like Avalanche and Phantom. Ambire lets you pay for gas and stable coins, meaning you'll never have to spend your precious ETH again. And if you like self-custody, but you still want training wheels, you can recover a lost Ambire wallet with an email and password, but without giving the Ambire team control over your funds. The Ambire wallet is coming soon for both iOS and Android. And if you want to be a beta tester, Ambire is airdropping their wallet token for simply just using the wallet. You can sign up at ambire.com and while you're there, sign up for the web app wallet experience as well. So thank you, Ambire, for pushing the frontier of smart contract wallets on Ethereum. Coinbase is suing the SEC, or as David Woo! would say, we are suing the we, SEC. We're suing the SEC. <laughs> This is a tweet from Paul, the chief legal officer at Coinbase. He says, Today we filed a narrow action in the U.S. Circuit Court to compel the SEC to respond yes or no to a rulemaking petition we filed with them last July asking them to provide regulatory guidance for the crypto industry. All they want is a simple yes or no. David, what is happening here? So I've never heard of this narrow action um, phrase before. I'm assuming it's a legal term. to uh, sue. They're suing them to do this one thing which is reply yes or no to this petition, which you've got pulled up, uh, that they filed with them last July. So they filed a petition. Um, if you want to skip over to that one, Ryan. Um, they filed this petition forever ago, and uh, Coinbase or is suing the SEC to get them to just say yes or no to this petition. Reply uh, to our Paul letter. Paul follows up his tweet saying, the SEC is required by law to respond to petitions, quote, within a reasonable time. But they have not yet responded to our petition from last July, which we are coming up to a, almost a year on, um, being May almost. Uh, and so that they are suing them for not doing that their job in a reasonable amount of time. Cool. <laughs> I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's just a yes or no lawsuit. But I mean, it, the implications of that are large. Have they not gone in for office hours with Gary, David? They have, not gone, they have not gone in for office hours. Jeez, well, come on, Coinbase. All you have to do is go to office hours. So we found this uh, Twitter thread from Meta Lawman, who is a lawyer who comments on this. Uh, and so here's what they, here's everything you need to know about this real quick. Real quick. Um, this case will move fast, he claims, unlike the Ripple case. Uh, this will uh, begins in the appellate court, not the trial court. I don't know what an appellate court is. Uh, there will be no discovery. Just a briefing and a hearing. Uh, he follows and says, Coinbase has an all-star legal team led by Eugene Scal uh, Scalia, former Secretary of Labor and son of Supreme Court Justice Anton, Anton uh, Scalia. Uh, Coinbase is seeking a writ of mandamus, which is, God, the legal system, which is a court order compelling the SEC to do its job and announce a decision on Coinbase's request for rulemaking. This action does not necessarily affect the SEC's timing for suing Coinbase as it has threatened to do. Again, it's a separate issue, which we will talk about. And then he follows up and says, I expect major industry players to pile in with amicus briefs supporting Coinbase's position. We might also see the House Financial Services Committee or individual members come in with briefs in support of Coinbase, which we recently saw from last week's hearing that, yes, there is a lot of support for this. Uh, the SEC commissioners will have to approve any response to Coinbase's action. There is a tiny chance that the SEC will blink and agree in exchange in rulemaking. If just one commissioner withdraws their support for Gary Gensler's regulation by an enforcement strategy, he's done. Wow. While Coinbase's action does not directly affect pending SEC cases against Ripple, Bittrex, and others, it does a great job in shining a spotlight on the SEC's, SEC's contradictory, contradictory positions about its authority to regulate digital assets. Other judges will take note. I remember, I think, a month ago? I can't remember when, but one theme of the roll-up was like, Gary Gensler is Icarusing. He's flying too close to the sun. He's gone too far. It was probably the weekly roll-up where they, the SEC announced the Wells notice against Coinbase. And what we said is like, oh, they just, they're, this Coinbase is too big. They're going to fight them tooth and nail. And also they're going to lose because they're standing on shaky footing. And so all of that is seemingly shaping up. And this is where we are. 
Yeah, by the way, um, in that uh, thread that you read, if just one commissioner withdraws their support for Gary Gensler, what uh, meta lawman means is one additional commissioner. We already mm. have some SEC commissioners. Hester right. Peirce, of course, has famously dissented with just about everything Gary has tried right. to do with his crypto policy. If she can get one more commissioner to dissent and uh, defect from Gary's side of things, then Gary is done. What does what that mean Lee he's Glamour done, says. though? He's like... He's That's a great lose? question. What does this yeah. mean by by done? Like, I don't uh, think it means he's fired. I just think it means he exactly. has to like capitulate right. uh, to this yeah. one particular issue. Um, there's some other things going on from Coinbase as well, including yeah. this video, which was just released as of this morning. David, what are we about to watch? Okay, so this is the Coinbase response to the SEC in video format. It's a longer video. It's 13 minutes. This is a four minute clip. Um, they are releasing their response. This is, they're also filing a, like a normal document that looks like a legal document, but they're also doing the 2023 thing, which is apparently to also you gotta fight. You got to wear suits. You got to wear suits <laughs> and you also have to fight on social media. And so we're taking the, we're taking the fight to uh, the, the algorithms. And so they are uh, posting this video on the Coinbase YouTube. Uh, and here is Brian and Paul uh, with their re uh, response to the SEC Wells notice. Uh, the, 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 Icarus saying of, of the SEC, this is their response. So let's watch this. Actually, Ryan and I have not watched this. So we are watching this for the first time right now. Let's go. To the chair, other commissioners and staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission, I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak directly to you. Huh. My name is Paul Graywell. I'm Coinbase's chief legal officer. And with me is Hi, Brian Paul. Armstrong, the chief executive officer and chairman. Hi, Brian. Coinbase. Official. I'd like to yes. start by turning things over to Brian to say a few words, Brian. Right. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So again, thank you for the opportunity to respond to this Wells notice. And I thought I'd share a few words just about the founding story of Coinbase and why I decided to base it here in the U.S. and how we've proactively sought out compliance over the last 11 years. So back in 2012, I had just read the Bitcoin white paper. And, you know, something clicked in my head when I first read this, that this might be a very important technology breakthrough that could help update the financial system globally. You know, I had had a firsthand experience seeing um, how difficult and challenging certain aspects of the financial system were. I had been a software engineer at Airbnb and I had seen how difficult it was to send and receive payments globally to 190 countries. Um, it was slow and expensive and difficult. Um, I had lived in Argentina actually for a year um, studying abroad and working abroad and I had seen what it, a country looked like that had gone through hyperinflation where people had lost trust in uh, the currency and they didn't have access to good financial services. They couldn't get loans, for instance, to buy a car or, or a home. And so when I read the Bitcoin white paper, I, I thought this might be an important breakthrough, something on the order of what we saw with the internet, a new global and decentralized system that could uh, make it easier for people to transmit value and, and update financial services globally. The next decision I had was, um, where do I want to start this company? Once, once I realized I wanted to start a company, and you know, I, I went to some early Bitcoin meetups in San Francisco and people were telling me, you, know, you shouldn't base it in the US, it's gonna to be too challenging. There's 50 state regulators and multiple federal regulators and you should start it in Hong Kong or Singapore. And um, there was other firms that were starting at that time that did that. But I made the choice at that moment to start the company in the US because I knew that even if it was more difficult, the US was a major market, there was respect for rule of law, um, the U.S. was a financial hub, a technology hub. It was a place where I felt entrepreneurs could work in good faith with regulators to help define clear rules for new industries as they emerged. And so I was lucky enough to raise some venture capital money. You know, the prototype on my laptop nights and weekends um, turned into a small company and we went off to the races. You know, 11 years later, fast forward, um, this strategy of proactively working with regulators in, in cases where it really wasn't clear what we should do because it was a new industry, we tried to do the right thing in the absence of clarity and um, show, demonstrate good faith effort that would allow us to bring this technology in a safe and thoughtful way to hopefully a billion people someday. So here we are um, as a public company, I think we've made enormous strides. And I think the message I'd, I'd really like to leave with the commissioners and the SEC is that uh, we're committed to working in, within the regulatory perimeter. We want to see uh, a clear market structure for trading crypto securities. Not all crypto assets are securities. There's also crypto commodities, there's stable coins, there's crypto that's artwork. We're gonna work with multiple regulators uh, to make this industry safe and trusted. And um, a Wells notice at this stage when there is not a clear rule book is not constructive and it's not good for America. 
Um, we are prepared to defend that position in court, but it doesn't have to come to that. We welcome a true dialogue about a workable <laughs> path forward for our industry. Now I'll hand it back over to Paul. Coindace has been talking to the SEC about our business for many years now, including sharing our legal views on our asset listing and staking services. We have repeatedly asked the SEC for its own views on how securities laws might apply to Coinbase and our industry. And to be candid, we've mostly gotten silence in response. Coinbase will defend itself vigorously in litigation if it comes to that. Whew. But it does not have to come to that. We will show up at your offices any day, any time, uh -huh. to discuss a workable path forward for our industry. But we won't find that path without true dialogue. Yo, bringing in the lawyer. That's that interesting. I, I think it's a great format, actually, rather than yeah. just a press release or a letter. It's just like a four minute YouTube video. And you would it, say that as a podcaster. Well, of course I would. I'm, a, you know, I'm a video <laughs> maximalist, podcast <laughs> maximalist. But also, I think that um, it's interesting the way Brian started with telling his personal story. Mm -hmm. And it's like the story that kind of like I chose to base this company in right. America. And I'm a patriot. I, I did the American dream thing where you start right. with an idea and then you develop that in America and then you like turn it into a publicly traded company. Right. Like I did all of the things that I thought you wanted me to do. Right. And now we're getting penalized with, with um, regulators who are just mm -hmm. unworkable and you sent Wells notices that there's mm -hmm. going to be enforcement and like, just stop it, right? Like, you're not even willing to talk to us. What's going on? I think it's effective. I hope it lands. What do you right. think? You think this video is going to land? Well, I think when you compare and contrast this video versus the Gary influencer video, like they didn't need to make this video. They just needed to submit a document, a legal document, which they did, which so few people are going to watch. So many more people are totally going to watch this video. And like, if you compare this video to Gary's, stupid stock footage influencer video, this is going to resonate way more. Well, do you know, do it's the, the reason everyone's doing these videos is because I think they all recognize that this is a battle for hearts and minds at this 100%, point in time. 100%. Right? It's not yeah. just, it's not just, it's, well, I'll see you in court, even though that was right. kind of the not so veiled uh, threat there, which is, thank God we have another check and balance. But right. it's, it's like also, Brian showing up to tell a story and then his lawyer next to him, the bad cop, being like, and, and we're we'll going sue to you. sue you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it's effective. Uh, David, you want to do some throwback clips of Gary Gensler, uh, the way yeah. he used to be before accepting the job here? Yeah, this is, uh, is pre-SEC Gary Gensler. This is before he turned into a paid shill for the banking sector. Uh, when he was a, a free man, if you will, uh, giving his free, unadulterated takes as a professor of knowledge at MIT. So here's what Gary has to say about how you start a decentralized crypto network. Let's hear from Gear Bear. And, 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 and it, it could be something that has no central authority right now, no central intermediary, and it's just had a jump start something. I think in that circumstance, it's more likely you need a native token. Hmm. Hmm. So you want to start a decentralized network. You need something to jumpstart it. And so Gary says that's why you use a native token. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Continue. Okay. Go on, but, Gary. But Ryan, do, do you think that those native tokens are securities? Let's, at, let's ask 2018 Gare Bear. Hmm. Here we go. So we already know in the U.S. and in many other jurisdictions that three quarters of the market are not ICOs or not what would be called securities, even wow. in the U.S., Canada and Taiwan, the three jurisdictions that follow something similar to the Howey test that we've talked about. Yeah. Three quarters of the market is, is non-securities. It's just a commodity, a cash Three quarters, crypto. Three quarters um, of so the crypto market, according to initial Gary. Initial coin offerings and what's a security and what's not a security. Relevant, relevant and important debate. But for three quarters of the market, it's not particularly relevant as a legal matter, huh. as a regulatory matter. Brodish. Huh. Wow. That 2018 is Gary. Gary sounding like he's making a lot of sense. I would get a beer with that guy. Ooh, that that guy great. sounds, uh, I like that. <laughs> I would take that class. That's incredible. Uh, this is uh, Brian Armstrong actually responding to this to this tweet. He's, he's retweeting it. The clip, and he just goes, "Wow, wow." Okay, so that could be interpreted like how how do you think he actually intended that to sound? Was that like a wow? 
Or was that like a, wow. Or do you think I that think was like was, a, whoa. <laughs> how, how do you think he meant that? <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's up to interpretation and all of the above are <laughs> fantastic interpretations. So, you know, do that in your head. But like, I, I got to say the same thing. Wow. This wow. was a completely different person mm-hmm. in 2018 where he said 75% of the market the you know the security versus commodity thing is not even up for debate, right? right. Um, seventy at least seventy five percent of the twenty eighteen market. By the way, that market was less clear than today's market. I yeah, think, too. Yeah, the twenty eighteen market was, was very. They were different. all they were all ICOs. There were a whole bunch of things. <laughs> so what has changed? With I want. Gary? I, uh, I can't wait to see Gary Gensler be presented with this in the court. Just like, yeah. hey, curious, Gary, um, what made you change your mind? On stage, like on, on trial? Yeah. You're, you're talking about like an under Under oath, on trial. When, yeah. when did you go from everything is a security? When did you go from three quarters of these things are not securities and we need native tokens to boost up a network to 99% are securities? Where yeah. was the change? What changed? Because yeah, something changed? happened. I something mean, we, acute we happened. Oh, there was a, there's Gary. a clear before after moment. And I would like to know uh, what caused that. I think it's like you get in a position of power and then your incentives totally change. So you're not incentivized towards kind of kind of like truth and actual communication of the story. You have a different agenda. Whether that's more mm-hmm. power accrual is maybe part of the agenda here. Whether this is more like political influence is part of the agenda where there's actually some kind of like lobby group that is drastically influencing you. We may never know, but um, we can only judge him by the 2018 Gary versus the 2023 Gary. And these are two completely different people. He, mm. that, that's the thing. When Do you remember at the time when Gary Gensler was actually replaced Jay Clayton right. as the SEC chair? And there was actually an air of maybe hope about this. Yeah, there was cautious like, optimism about Gary Gensler, well, because we saw, us. Because we, we knew these 2018 clips. And we're right. like, finally, a regular that understands it. this industry. Yeah. Uh-huh. And now he's used that understanding and completely like abandoned it in pursuit of some different agenda it's right. very unfortunate yeah but um let's uh let's talk about what we can do mm-hmm. so there is some action that uh that we can take um what is this david can i mint an nft and support a cause here how does this work that's exactly what you can do ryan so coinbase is starting a stand with crypto campaign where you can mint a commemorative shield nft it's an nft with a shield it's literally an emoji uh, and it's uh, a very, very low price mint, something like 0.007 Ether, I think. Uh, so Ryan's going to go there right now. He's going to connect our friends and sponsors at MetaMask, the wallet there, so he can go and mint this thing. Do you want? Are you making me mint it right now? I'm making you mint it right now, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. The mint is free, Coinbase. but there is a, donate, a Zora, Zora charges a fee. That fee is like 0.077 Ether or something, so like a couple dollars which goes to the Gitcoin advocacy round. So all of the fees from this Shield Mint NFT plus 100,000 DAI donated, I believe, by Coinbase is going to the Gitcoin advocacy round. Uh, so Ryan is going to mint his NFT with uh, MetaMask, our friends and sponsors at MetaMask. Thank you for, for, for doing that. Uh, and then a little bit of, oh, excuse me, 0.000777 Ether. It's real cheap. The, the, real the gas cheap. will cost you a lot more than the actual price of the NFT. <laughs> Let me tell you. It's about ten dollars in total right now. <laughs> uh, okay, so Ryan just minted one. Uh, so thank you for donating to the Gitcoin advocacy round, uh, and You're that's welcome. going out. And thank uh, you for supporting uh, supporting crypto, Ryan. I appreciate that. I also burnt some ETH in that transaction, also, you also David. Some ETH, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So we are fighting back. We are pushing back on this, uh, David. We actually have Paul, the chief legal officer at Coinbase, coming on the show a little bit later too. Uh, what's happening there? Yeah, it will be out by the time the Bank Station is listening to this. So Thursday night, uh, we are uh, live streaming with Paul, uh, who is coming up. You're going to come on and we're going to talk to him about suing the SEC. So that's going to be pretty sweet. Looking forward <laughs> to that one. <laughs> I can't wait to hear I, l- I, I prefer to talking to the bad cop in, the, in this scenario. Yeah. David, another fight for crypto, though, is uh, the mainstream narrative. That's Mm -hmm. a fight I think we still need to uh, put in some work on. John Oliver on his show last week tonight uh, covered crypto. It's his second major crypto episode in about a 25-minute segment. And I think he really expresses what the mainstream thinks about crypto right now. Of course, he covered the events of, of 2022. So he talked about FTX. He talked about Terra. He talked about Celsius. Uh, And his conclusion was pretty much that crypto is mostly a scam, almost Mm -hmm. 100% a scam. 
And I don't blame him necessarily for reaching right. that conclusion given 2022. Yep. And yet it falls so short. So David, I think we should maybe play some clips and give uh, the bankless listeners a flavor of, of what the, the conversation was. But FTX has been just one of the many dominoes that fell in the crypto world. Over the past two years, the market value of all cryptocurrencies fell from around three trillion in late 2021 to around one trillion last year. And there are small investors who got badly hurt by all of this. One in five Americans has invested in, traded, or used cryptocurrency. And you can find countless stories of people losing most of their life savings in the recent implosions, underscoring that everyone in crypto was never actually going to make it, no matter how much Randy Zuckerberg scream sang otherwise. <laughs> so tonight, we thought we'd take a look at what has been happening in the world of crypto by looking at three of the biggest collapses over the past year. Each of these companies was founded on the promise that they would replace some part of our financial system. There is Terra, a cryptocurrency, Celsius, a crypto bank, and FTX, a crypto trading platform. In theory, they were supposed to be our next dollar, our next Bank of America, and our next stock exchange. But in reality, they are fiascos. So far, David, I, he's not wrong on these takes. Yeah. I mean, these are the exact takes that, that we had in yeah. uh, 2022. It's just... Well, we didn't think of these about the, not not these specifically, but we are replacing the dollar. We are replacing the stock exchange. It's not FTX. It's Uniswap. It's yep. not Terra. It might be something like Dai. Um, yeah. It's not Celsius. It's DeFi. Right. right? Yeah. That's the thing. And but so these are our narratives. These are the words that are, we use. He's not wrong. Is right. what I'm saying. Let, let, let's play another clip. Just as a reminder, every single crypto coin is just something someone with a laptop made up. That is true for all of them, like Dogecoin, Catcoin, Pandacoin, Furrycoin, Cumrocket, Elon Sperm, and Monkey Jizz. Those are all real, by the way. We were going to come up with a fake one as a joke, but then we saw Monkey Jizz and it felt like a hat on a hat. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent any of these coins have value, it's based on whether people believe they do, which often comes down to their confidence in the person or group who made the coin. And that basic fact makes the crypto business very attractive to a certain type of person. One columnist who's covered this intensively sums it up like this. If you are running a scam, you will be drawn to crypto. You are running a confidence game, and crypto offers the most efficient market for turning confidence into money. David, I mean, it's he's also takes, right about dude. that, right? He's also right about that. It, money is a confidence game. That's what we've been saying on Bankless this entire time. He's just applying it in this more narrow. It's like, yeah, the largest, most chest pounder dude or developer is the new winner in this world. Well, um, the idea that scammers are attracted to crypto is also right. We've also I mean, like, talked about this, yeah. We've, He's we've right about everything about so far. Okay, okay. So that was that God, was a flavor. You got three point three million views. Yeah, this is mainstream. This is what mainstream actually thinks, and they're not wrong about FTX and Celsius and Terra. I mean, they're yeah. exactly right. But let's finish with the conclusion here, which is where I think uh, John Oliver goes off track. <laughs> And the thing is, there are still companies out there making all the same claims that you've seen tonight. And I'm not saying that they are all scams. Maybe these three are the exceptions, although they would be joining all the other exceptions that we haven't had time to talk about tonight, from BitConnect to Quadriga to so, yeah. so many yeah. more. But the truth is, in a financial system where the only real currency is confidence, scammers are going to thrive. And I know that we usually like to point to a solution at the end of our stories, and that often means calling for more regulation. But I'm not sure that's a good idea here. The danger is regulation might give this sector more legitimacy. It'll make a risky investment look safe when it is clearly not. And that, in turn, might entice banks to start getting more involved in crypto, giving the sector even more legitimacy and also exposing all of us to its volatility. It really says a lot that one of the leading advocates for the government to strongly regulate crypto was Sam Bankman-Fried. And look, I'm absolutely not saying that we should get rid of crypto entirely. It could eventually be useful. Maybe the third time that we talk about it, we'll all be using a digital coin to buy everything. I doubt it, but I can't predict the future. After all, I'm no Jim Cramer. <laughs> but, but we should recognize that right now, the main thing you can really do with crypto is gamble with more crypto. This is all still a casino. So if you do want to invest, do your own due diligence, never put in more than you can afford to lose. And if you ever see someone doing this, This run. is Alex Mashinsky doing like the Archer pose. Yeah. Um, 
So what do you yeah, think? Yeah, that What's was that was a rough conclusion? conclusion. That was a rough conclusion. What? Not entirely wrong, but what parts are rough to you? Oh, how uh, we shouldn't regulate it to give it legitimacy because then if you give it legitimacy, it might integrate and oh well, the regular financial system will invo- uh, absorb the scams and the volatility of crypto. It's like, no, yeah. you regulate it so you get rid of the scams and volatility. See, I, I mean, I think it's I'm not saying we should that do that either, but. Th- this is, this though, David, is the mm-hmm. narrative that crypto is up against in 2023. And it's both kind of a, a headwind. This is what 2021 costs us. 2022 costs us. Yeah. It's both a headwind and 2021, like you're talking about the bull market run up and 2022 is when the scammers, yeah, yeah, that whole period, the last, the last bull market costs us this. That's exactly. Yeah. Um, here's, I think the interesting part about this and why I think there's an opportunity. Um, for me, the scam slamming he just did was, was actually cathartic. I mean, we did a lot of that ourselves and the ridicule for SBF and and Doe Kwan and Mashinsky is totally deserved. But the conclusion that all crypto's a scam, that's right. where I think there's some hubris, right? And I think the, the problem with the mainstream narrative here is you can finish John Oliver's show, and I watched the whole thing, and you could feel like you completely understand crypto. Right. Like that is the, mm-hmm. I guess, the hidden, um, the hidden problem with a show like this right. is you're like, oh, that crypto thing, all, you know, all the everything that was going on, the big price run up, it was just a bunch of scams. Ha, I thought so. And then you're going to dismiss it and you're going to miss out on the alternative to Celsius, which is DeFi and the alternative to FTX, which are Uniswap and uh, Coinbase type regulated exchanges and Kraken. And you can miss the alternative to, uh, you know, a stable coin, for instance, like, like Terra, and you'll miss something like DAI and everything, all the innovation that's going on. So the reason it's an opportunity, David, is because I think right now, just like in 2019, when crypto was dead and the cycles before that, we're getting the same sentiment. And I am happy to have the counter trade to that because I think this is what the mainstream narrative thinks right now. And so to me, this is a massive buying opportunity if you believe the opposite. If you believe that crypto isn't a scam, if you believe there is real innovation here, if you believe that stable coins will be absolutely massive, if you believe that DeFi will actually um, change the world and be the way we bank in the future. Right. This is a massive counter trade opportunity. No, that, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. This is a great signal of how, when you are, uh, being a contrarian investor about something that, you know, you have high confidence in being right about. Um, but it, it gives me 2018 to 2020 vibes when we felt that about Ethereum. Dare yeah. we call this a bottom signal? Oh, certainly. I mean, it's one of the bottom signals, right? In the same right. way Randy like, Zuckerberg video was a top signal. We're all going to make sure. it. Sure. I mean, and like also this, uh, uh, John Oliver's audience is the exact kind of people. I'm going to, um, Blake a statement here is like all of the people who were bitter about the crypto people making a bunch of money in 2021, 2022, this show is for them. They yes. want to watch <laughs> the show and be like, Oh, I'm I so right. I, I believe exactly. in myself. Yeah. All, all the, all the crypto haters that got bitter that their crypto friend made a bunch of money. I'll call them smart fart smellers, uh, <laughs> <laughs> are watching this show and being like, Hmm. Oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally what happened. Right. And so and that, yet- that is his audience. Right. And that's why the conclusion he has of like, don't even give it any legitimacy. Don't even regulate it. The conclusion of that show doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a good take for him yep. to conclude, to get the views, to get the people to, you know, smell their farts yeah, and all yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. <laughs> that, that's exactly how he was going to end the show <laughs> on exactly that note, because that's right. what the audience wanted. Right. And uh, you know that he would never produce a counter show in the peak of a market talking about like how the crypto is doing the crypto thing. You know, you yep. would never see that. You would only ever yep. see the show in the bear market. Yeah. So I, I don't act. I mean, crypto gave him all of the ammo to produce that show that he needed. We, we just served that to him on a platter. I do not, do not blame him at all for no that. Take. I'm yeah. just pointing out that it's an incredibly shallow take. That's what the overall mainstream narrative thinks Is about that crypto Geist, right yeah. now. Uh-huh. And so if you counter trade that, uh, I think it could be a, a good move yeah. right now. If you believe yeah. the opposite, David, what do we have coming up next? Coming up next, we got some updates on the Binance Voyager deal. Sad for Voyager. We're also going to talk about SBS mom of all people. <laughs> SBS mom. Uh, I won't sing the song. Uh, Lens <laughs> launching in layer three and Solana has got a thing 
that's making me feel things. And we're going to talk about that. But first, we're going to talk to all of these sponsors that make this show possible, especially MetaMask, who, if we're using all these weird crypto words, crypto jargon, MetaMask has a product for you called MetaMask Learn. Let's go hear about it. Learning about crypto is hard. Until now, introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, vocabulary, it is still a jargon-free experience for the crypto-curious user. Friendly, not scary. MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So, are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Voyager tweets out, today we received a letter from Binance terminating the asset purchase agreement. While this development is disappointing, our chapter 11 plan allows us for direct distribution of cash and crypto to customers via the Voyager platform. So Binance US is backing out of the crypto deal. They cite regulatory challenges for that termination of that deal. And so Binance says, while our hope throughout this process was to help Voyager's customers access their crypto in kind, the hostile and uncertain regulatory climate in the United States has introduced an unpredictable operating environment impacting the entire American business community. Oof, thanks, Gary. Uh, so, uh, poor one out. They're blaming for, regulators for not right? doing this. So, so Voyager, of course, was like another Celsius in right. that a bunch of depositors were left holding the bag. Retail yeah, depositors, they were, well, Voyager lent Three Arrows Capital $600 million unsecured. So that was pretty dumb of them, um, of yeah, retail money. They did a ton of dumb things, but this was also an opportunity for all of the creditors to actually right. do a little bit better than mm -hmm. kind of a pure asset sale bankruptcy. And uh, Binance is blaming that on regulators for not going through. But imagine if you're a Voyager creditor, right? right. This is basically what happened to you. Right. First, you thought FTX was going to save you. And then FTX imploded. Then you thought Binance was going to save you. And then the US blocked the sale. Now the court allows the sale to go through. Then Binance pulls out. That's the full story. If you're a Voyager creditor and you had funds tied up in Voyager, um, very sad, just getting dunked in the tank again and again and again. Um, feels bad to have yeah. put money in any kind of quote unquote crypto bank these days. Yeah. And it's because of, of Gary. It's because of Gary. 100%, right? Right? Gary, in the, everything that represents, he's become the main character for Operation Choke Point. So, yeah. yes, I agree. It's Operation Choke Point, it's Gary Gensler and friends. Uh, speaking of friends, does SBF have any friends left, David? I guess his parents are still friendly because he's living back at home with mom and dad. And now there's some scrutiny on SBF's parents. What's going on? Yeah, so a judge has approved restrictions for SBF's parents. So uh, SBF's mom and dad are now getting strict cell phone monitoring while he is under house arrest because they are fearful that SBF will just say, hey, mom, can I use your phone? <laughs> <laughs> so a consultant just will- Just one tweet, mom. <laughs> just, yeah, just one post. A consultant will review keystroke logs and screenshots of Joseph Bankman and Barbara Frankman's uh, free bank, Barbara Freed's cell phones at least three times per week. Monitoring software are on the Bankman Freed's parents' phones 
and they photograph the user every five minutes to make sure it's not Sam. So the phone takes a picture every five minutes, and if Sam Bankman Free's face is there, they get in trouble. Dude, wow. that's hilarious. Can, can you, like, how mad would you be at your son if this was, like, the situation here? The, the weird thing about this, though, is we don't know if they're innocent part that they're innocent parties at all. Like there seems to be a lot of evidence that they may have actually been tied up in this whole criminal enterprise. Like I think like Nick Carter and friends call it the crime family or something. Yeah. 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 Uh Yeah, Crime syndicate. And so you don't know how deeply they're involved, but it's, um, it's hilarious to think SBF back at home. Can't use mom and dad's cell phone even. Uh, is That's completely so locked out of that. That's so funny. I have All so right. many jokes I can make. I be, and we just need to move on, or else I'll make them. Lens protocol. What are they doing? Uh, an optimistic layer three solution. Uh, so Lens deploying a layer three to process transactions at hyperscale. They say and designed to support the next generation of Web three social users. This is call it a roll app, an app chain as a roll up as oh, a layer three. I like three. that roll app. Yeah, yeah, you've heard that before, right? No, that's the first ah. time I've heard that, that ah. term. Well, I sadly can't like take that. credit for that one, um, okay. but uh, to you, I will. Uh, so yeah, uh, Lens uh, Layer 3 Rollup. I'm assuming this is deployed on Polygon um, because that's where Lens is. Um, so cool. Bonsai is what they're calling it because of the whole plant metaphor. That's very cool. Um, DevConnect Istanbul, Ryan, uh, this is not necessarily for the Bankless Nation, although they're welcome to listen to this announcement about DevConnect Istanbul 2023. This is actually for me to you to tell you that I'm going to be in Istanbul in the 13th to the 19th of November for DevConnect. Also, if any Bankless listeners wants to come, I'll be there too. DevConnect is different than DevCon, right, David? Yes. Is this more yeah. So think of it like a binary star system, and one's bigger than the yeah. other, and this is the okay. little star, but they rotate, and star. so it goes DevCon, DevConnect, DevCon, DevConnect, every like nine months Very or cool. so. Oh, man. You're, you're traveling all over the world, David. Are you ever at home anymore? God, it has been a while, dude. <laughs> it has been a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but tell us about this. So you are excited about a... Solana project. A I Solana can't project, yeah. It's an NFT project, so I, you know... Maybe people would have suspected that's the way they they get you. They hook you into the Solana community. Yeah. Mad Labs. Mad Lads. What is it? Uh, I mean, I don't know. It's an NFT project. They look really cool. Their volume was the number one most traded volume, at least in the last seven days. So they are just eking above Bored Apes and Mutant Apes. Uh, and so, uh, so this is why this is news uh, is because they are dominating the seven day volume, at least on NFT sales. The, the, uh, mint went live they had some like mint drama. Um, but, uh, they're past that. I think they look pretty cool. I you think like the art. I, I like the art. I like the art. I do not own one cause I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to use Solana. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? Wait, what'd you say? <laughs> I've never Come used on. it. I, I own some soul tokens that I bought at like $9 or something. Um, but it's yeah, it's super easy. On Coinbase. Fan, just grab a phantom wallet, just connect. I've done stuff on uh, Solana. I have a, a podcast NFT on Solana. Yeah, I know you, you do. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll probably go I'll go buy one of these on Solana and I'll be the first one to use it. You heard Solana. it. Solana yeah. community. You heard it yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, Tweet yeah. it out when you do. I mean, look at these. They're, they're pretty cool looking. So like the 20s, 20s mobster themed, like um, uh, like it's like a comic book uh, noir theme, I think. I, I, I'd say like a noir movie type. Um, yeah, I, th- I think they're pretty cool. I think they're pretty cool. Yeah, I get this. Yeah. I vibe with this. Yeah, you if like you it? You denominate in soul if you buy it though. Yeah, That's I don't, what, know. Uh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyways, uh, moving on. <laughs> you want to take this one? Well, David, we can't just talk about U.S. regulatory uh, system. We got to talk about what's going on in Europe. Mika, we did an entire episode on this legislation. Uh, looks like it is going through. After more than two and a half years of consultation, heated debates, last-minute amendments, and very close votes in the committee, the EU's parliament today passed the new EU re- crypto framework with an impressive majority. 517 MEPs for and 38 votes against. This is the most comprehensive regulatory framework for crypto that's ever been passed by any major government body. Uh, We did an entire episode on this, and the conclusion from our crypto EU Mika experts was this was about a a B- in terms of its, its quality and its goodness for crypto. So it could have been a lot worse we could have had a, a failing grade, an F or, or a D or something like that. Average would have been C. They rated it as B minus. And I think 
I mostly agree with that. It leaves much to be desired, but it provides some clarity. Like, for instance, Europe, David, doesn't have the problem of is Ether a security or a commodity or not? There's no Gary Gensler of mm. Europe um, blocking all of these things. It's quite clearly detailed as to what the nature of uh, Ether, the asset, is. It's a commodity in EU legislation. Um, a few comments from, from the panel that we talked to. The U.S. is getting its pants beat by global regulation. As a comment. That we're this, getting our pants beat by a B minus. Nice. Yeah, it's a B minus ahead, but there's still room for the EU to fail here. There's some other regulation that, that might be upcoming. AMLR, the Data Act is, is one of them. There's some more. So before anyone in the US says, we're moving to Europe and throws that party, I think we've got to get through this heavier regulation and see where we come out on the other side. So there's still room to fail the semester. Uh, this wow. was just one test, but B minus on the first test. It's better than the United right. States. That's for sure. Okay. All right. I don't know if I should be optimistic or pessimistic. B minus my first reaction is like B minus. Cool. We can start from there and work get that. better. Uh, but then I guess you could start from there, get worse. Anyways, you can. Whatever. So some of the most boomer news that we'll ever put into a weekly roll-up. TransUnion, the credit scoring company, is uh, allow uh, working with some partners to deliver credit scoring to blockchain. Hey, that's <laughs> so cool though. TLDR, they are allowing, um, they're basically being an oracle for credit scores on a blockchain. So you have yeah, your credit like score. your FICO score. Your FICO score. Yeah, you can put that on a blockchain so that something like Ave could like review that credit score and be like, okay, I'll give this person a line of credit. It's not going to work exactly like that, but that's kind of the deal. I think There's, that's awesome, so, actually. It, it's, it's not a terrible use case. Um, there's like, you can get, it's private as well. So you can get some privacy. It's one of the earliest, most primitive building blocks for building like uncollateralized lending. Um, it's a thing. Cool. We do need credit in DeFi. We, we have credit. none. It's all collateral backed loans at this point. Do need credit. Um, speaking of releases, Fee has released something here. PHI, that's Fee. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Fee land. Uh, so this is like a super cute project that I just think is awesome. Uh, Fee land. We talked about it before. It's like this 3d landscape for building a little metaverse for yourself that you put objects on based off of what you've done in your Ethereum wallet. So if you've traded on Uniswap, you get a little Uniswap building. If you bought on OpenSea, you get a little OpenSea ship. Bankless has got some stuff. So if you're a Feeland user, you got some bankless things that you can uh, claim. So if you're a bank holder, you get a little wagon. If you are a podcast NFT holder, you get a little cute little version of me and Ryan, a uh, little icon to claim. If you are a POAP po holder, you get a wallpaper. Uh, so if you are a user of Feeland, if you're not a user of Feeland, you should definitely check it out. It's like the most fun identity Web3 non-financial app. So checks all those boxes and it's, it's just pretty fun. It's also a great way to like do, you go on quests to claim these things, right? Um, and so some of the, these are what we're looking at, these four quests that we've got. Um, and so uh, if you are a fee land user and you are a Bankless Nation member, you have some objects that you can go play, claim and go put in your little fee land. So this is uh, go do that and then take a screenshot and tweet it and tag Bankless so we can see and we'll retweet it. This is like your on-chain resume or maybe like yeah. your on-chain uh, trophy case or something mm -hmm. like this. It's yeah, just exactly. a lot of fun to build your the, profile. The artist the behind this, by the way, is the same artist for the noun style. This is why it's pixelated and looks like that. Very cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Another release this week, Swell Network. What are they up to? Uh, Swell Network, we've talked about them before. Uh, Live Mainnet is now in public beta. So this is a staking as a service like Rocket Pool, like Lido, like all the other ones. Uh, brand new DAO uh, with uh, plans to integrate distributed validator technology, which is more technology that, that I get super hot on. Uh, and so they are launching. Their mainnet is launched. Uh, so uh, they would like you to join their community is their deal. Uh, and also stake. stake. Also stake, yeah. Should also mention both Fee and Swell. Uh, Dave and I are angel investors mm -hmm. in these projects. Really excited about them. Um, yeah. Jobs of the week, David. Speaking of excitement jobs. here, we got some jobs at Coinbase. Mm. A staff blockchain engineer, a staff smart contract engineer. Uh, I think working with Jesse Powell and team. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Jesse's a nice guy. We like what I've heard. Phantom, software engineer mobile. Phantom is hiring software engineer front end. They just released their wallet, by the way, to mm -hmm. Polygon and Ethereum. Awesome pro project. Lots of jobs here today. Premium so wants jobs. a Web3 product management and architect. Uh, Denera wants a smart contract engineer. Uniswap Labs needs a senior backend engineer. Senior product uh, designers for Uniswap as well. There's a ton of jobs. Dude, scroll today. down. There's so, so many jobs. There are so many. Yeah, Look, how many, know, jobs there. Look how many jobs there are. Look how many jobs there are. 
They, it keeps on drops. growing. It's one of those it's things that drops. you keep on scrolling and it keeps on loading. There's so many Look, drops. Cri- crypto. This is a bear market in crypto and it's still hiring like, like crazy, which is uh, impressive. Coming up next, we got the questions from the nation. We're going to talk about AI and blockchain and what that intersection looks like. So that's the question from the nation. Uh, it's also a similar, a take from the week. Chamath Palihapitiya from uh, the All In podcast gives a take that crypto is dead. Do we disagree with that take or do we not disagree with that take? We'll talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what we are bullish on. So all of that and more. But first, I want to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. The Phantom Wallet is coming to Ethereum. The number one wallet on Solana is bringing its millions of users and beloved UX to Ethereum and Polygon. If you haven't used Phantom before, you've been missing out. Phantom was one of the first wallets to pioneer Solana staking inside the wallet and will be offering similar staking features for Ethereum and Polygon. But that's just staking. Phantom is also the best home for your NFTs. Phantom has a complete set of features to optimize your NFT experience. Pin your favorites, hide your uglies, burn the spam, and also manage your NFT sale listings from inside the wallet. Phantom is, of course, a multi-chain wallet, but it makes chain management easy, displaying your transactions in a human-readable format with automatic warnings for malicious transactions or phishing websites. Phantom has already saved over 20,000 users from getting scammed or hacked. So get on the Phantom waitlist and be one of the first to access the multi-chain beta. There's a link in the show notes, or you can go to phantom.app slash waitlist to get access in late February. Bankless is launching the Bankless Token Hub. At Bankless, we've been studying the crypto markets ever since 2017, and all of our research has led us to this, the Token Hub. You're a one-stop shop for Alpha to help you navigate through the crypto markets. Have you ever wished for a trusted resource that would share their thoughts, ratings, and their opinions about tokens? Boy, do we have the product for you. The Bankless Token Hub is where we provide bankless citizens with the alpha on the hottest tokens in crypto. We do the research so you don't have to. The Bankless Token Hub includes the token ratings, where our team shares their research and outlook on the hottest tokens tokens in crypto. Also, the token hub includes Bankless Bags, our own internal investment club. Bankless Bags is where we put our money where our mouth is. And for the Bankless Power user out there, you can access the analyst team 24-7 inside the Bankless Nation Discord. You can ask them questions and learn from a group of people deep in the weeds of crypto investing. The last feature of the token hub is the ability to upvote or downvote token ratings. The Bankless Token Hub lets you learn from your fellow citizens to rate these tokens yourselves. The Bankless Token Hub is launching right now and has already been beta tested by your fellow Bankless citizens. So stay tuned in the Bankless Discord for updates. And if you're not a Bankless citizen, well, you better sign up if you want access because this corner of Bankless is available for citizens only. I'll see you in the Discord. We have a question from Rocket Polster this week. David, you ready for this? Yeah, hit me. Rocket Pulsar goes, given a future of AI, deep fakes, disinformation, and blockchains, what companies and projects are at the forefront of ensuring provenance and how? Is in brackets hardware? Question mark. So we acknowledge all of these problems with AI becoming like we don't know who the robots are online. Uh, you know, whether the robots created this piece of content or a human did. And robots are like infinitely scalable, okay? Very, very cheap to spin up. Um, we've always had sort of a, when it was just the humans on the internet, there was a cost to kind of producing information. And uh, now there's this ability to mass spread all sorts of information, like un- like information that's not credible, all sorts of things. So is there a blockchain solution to this or is there any solution to this that you've seen? Yeah, so um, really prescient question, I'd say. Uh, I think there is, and dare I say, Rocket Pulsar is looking for alpha. <laughs> uh, about like, okay, what, what are the companies here? Because they're probably, I'm assuming that they are bullish on the intersection of AI and crypto and specifically Providence, right? Um, this is one of the really early use cases of uh, crypto that we've seen before. Uh, once upon a time, there was fake news shared about Vitalik's death and uh, about Vitalik's assassination and the Ether price started to plummet. And so Vitalik took a selfie with a piece of paper of the current block height of Ethereum and just to prove that it, it was recent enough and then tweeted like that proof out. Proof of life, right? Proof of life, right? Uh, and, and then... And then it, the press recovered and we moved on. So like you could use the same sort of format with, with like AI, right? And this is just called timestamping. You just like submit a hash and a block 
about the origination of some content before you release it to the public so that when everyone's like, what's the real source of this? You can prove that you have the most original piece of content. So there's- and you could sign that with a private key as well, right? Sign that with a private key, right. Yeah, uh-huh. And like, that's actually not really a revolution in cryptography that is, or crypt- cryptocurrency. That is a revolution in database design as a blockchain. That's a database um, solution. And cryptography. It's totally cryptography, a cryptography yes. solution. Yes. That is actually an a- solution that's absent of the currency other than we need a system to secure the database and that's what we use, need the currency for. Anyways, I digress. I kind of see two um, venues here. There is the venue of just like identity. So like WorldCoin is implicitly going after this. Any sort of identity on a blockchain, the identity play is a part of this. Like provenance in the world of AI, we need human AI. Um, you can trust me because you're listening to me on Bankless and I'm a human and you've been listening to me for a while and I'm going to tell you that I own davidhoffman.eth so you can go to davidhoffman.eth and you can assume that that's a, a human player. And As another human like, like me is going to socially right. verify that you own davidhoffman.eth, right. Right? right? And that's kind of yeah. enough to prove that you're a human. Yeah, but you're an AI, so... <laughs> <laughs> and there, that does get precarious, so there's, there could be more perfect um, ways of doing that. But there's like the the... The, what I'm saying is like there are companies that will go directly after this problem and then there are other ways that are adjacent to this that provide solutions to this problem adjacently and that's the identity world. Um, and then there perhaps there are companies that are going directly after that after this, which is just like a time stamping company. I remember in 2017 there was like an ICO that was like a time stamping company on Bitcoin and for some reason the Bitcoiners thought it was bullish. Um but I don't know of any, I can't name any specific ones, but it is a very, that's a, that is a worthwhile place of uh, research to explore, I would say. I think it's huge. I think it's so important. Uh, yeah, this tidal wave of manipulative content is about to hit the internet. So we got to find out who the humans are and who the robots are. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's also a national security threat. Like this is kind of nation state, like when nation states can attack other nation states with robo propaganda, right. right? Like how do you actually, con- like, this is just an, a massive tidal wave that's going to hit everybody. And mm-hmm. what I've seen, David, is like we have the building blocks in crypto. It's mm-hmm. going to be something crypto or crypto adjacent. Like we have the, the ability to store uncensorable, provable data on, on computers that are always running, cannot be taken down, cannot be censored. We got that. We got the um, private key cryptography um, and kind of the management. We have some of the early stages of identity type systems. Um, Worldcoin kind of takes it to the, we can actually prove a human using like iris scan uh, type data. And by the way, I think we want to get Worldcoin on the podcast at some point to discuss this. Oh, it's scheduled. But we have that scheduled. I, Sam Altman I, and the co-founder are coming on. I haven't seen anybody who's put this together in a way that's like scalable and going to work. There's like a lot of slides and a lot of companies promising and decentralized identity has been a theme. Verifiable credentials have been a thing that people have talked about. But who is actually putting yeah, it all together? A lot of talk, right? But like, who's actually putting it together and making it scalable and making it ready for the world? So the solution is completely clear. I know it's going to, I like, I feel very strongly it's going to be crypto or crypto adjacent. What can I invest in? Like, where's the mm-hmm. alpha? I'm a, I mean, that's what I want. I'm, I'm kind of back with Rocket Polster. And the truth is, I haven't quite seen the project that really excites right. me on this yet. Yeah. But it's got to come, right? We got to yep. solve this. Someone's going to yeah, solve yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I think the big question is just like, does this get solved emergently by a collection of adjacent technologies, like I was saying, or is there one particular startup that's going to tackle this problem head on? Like, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I agree. All right, we'll we'll keep our eyes peeled. Great and we'll let you guys Great know. We love uh, Rocket Polster. Let's get to some takes this week, David. The first take is one we teased earlier from uh, Chamath from the All Chamath. In podcast. He says, David, crypto is dead. In America, I saw this tweet from CNBC. He said, in the, in the US, it's dead. But I think we should go straight to the source and actually hear what he said in context. So let's play that. I was just curious to get uh, your thoughts. SEC obviously sent a Wells notice. We talked about this before to Brian Armstrong of Coinbase. He said he's thinking about uh, or considering relocating out of the US if the regulatory clarity does not improve. Crypto's dead in America. It is dead in America. <laughs> Crypto's dead in America. I mean, now you had Game Gensler. So matter of fact, you had like. Gensler even blaming the banking crisis on crypto. So, they've the the United States authorities have firmly pointed their guns at crypto. Hmm. Is, is it a scapegoat or was it a fuck around find out moment for crypto in your mind, or a little bit of both? I I don't know. I 
just think that they were probably the ones that were the most threatening to the establishment. Okay. And they were the ones that, in fairness to the regulators, did push the boundaries more than any other sector of the startup economy. And yeah, so now they're paying the price for that. The bill has yeah. come due for them. What do you think about that take, Dave? I love how yeah. they talk oh. about this. Uh, they talk about us as like a, all of them, them, the crypto industry. And like, I, yeah, we do, do we do the same? We do the same things, of course. Everyone does this. This, but it's like interesting. You blanket in the industry receiving. with yeah, uh-huh. yeah. The crypto yeah. people, they, they, their check has come due, right? It's like that is not my check, Chamath. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't cash that one. <laughs> well, what do you think of his uh, overall take then? So yeah, yeah, that's the, that was our take for our last week on the weekly roll ups. Like, yeah, uh huh. Crypto is dead in America. So I mean, that's, I a actually, hyper, that's a hyperbolic statement. The, Chamath yes. is a little bit of a diva. All of these guys are a little bit of divas. So are we. Content producers are kind of divas. Uh, he's being a little bit of a diva. Uh, he's not wrong. Everything he says right. By saying his statement so emphatically and hyperbolically, that's what you're saying. Yeah. And you agree with the, the, the tone and the thrust of, of that statement. But I bet you'd have some like quibbles with, it's not actually dead in America. Yeah. I mean, we haven't like outlawed crypto. We just... We're in front of um, Congress last week, and Gary Gensler was thoroughly grilled for his anti-innovation, anti-crypto right. posturing. I right. think it's, um, for me, it's a step too far to say crypto is dead in America. 100%. It's- 100%. And I think if you if we were having a conversation with him and we were nitpicking, he would become much more moderate about it. Yeah. Because like, as the high-level headline, as crypto's as dead as in America. Yeah. yeah. And it's, like, it's a little bit of like a quote-unquote bottom signal, right? Like, he is... He is presenting a specific snapshot in time. And what he's saying, a way to interpret this is like, this is the worst moment in crypto's American relationship ever. Yes, that's accurate. And Coinbase is going to sue the F out of Gary Gensler and the SEC, and we're going to come back. And so it's up only from here in terms of uh, the health of our relationship with America. I think so. If he's also making the broader point, like one purpose of the soundbite, that headline on CNBC is like, you could phrase this another way. The regulators or the government is killing crypto in America, yeah. right? That's also yeah. hyperbolic, but that also kind of like prompts for Expresses some action. Like, point, what yeah. are you guys doing? You're screwing this up. You're right. leaving America behind. And I hope that's kind of the the takeaway here too. I right. uh, got some more takes here. David, here is from Ethereum on ARM. This mm-hmm. is, uh, what are we looking at? We're looking at some hardware here? Yeah, so I put this one in here. This is an Ethereum staking node. You can tell like how close up we are to this tiny little box because of the, the blur, blur effect on the uh, on the camera. This has got to be what three inches by three inches by one inch of a of a, a computer full full computer wow. that's an Ethereum staking node. This is this is, I had to phrase it this way because but it's so awesome. This is the smallest, most powerful dissident technology form factor <laughs> that exists. This is a nation state. This is a network freedom state. Technology. In a, this is a freedom technology. There's no, like, you can't, this is Ethereum. You cannot shut this down. One, one of these things in every person's home in like one in 100 people's home. It doesn't matter. It's like so powerful. There's capital on this thing. It's verifying a network. It is an online network state. Uh, it is, it is cryptography. It is cryptocurrency. It is just the instantiation of everything that is so cool about the frontier of technology, of the industry that we are building. And it's, it's, it's uh, I, like, I hate to be an anti-statist. I am an anti-statist, but it's like big F you to nation states because like, I don't look, see, what, I don't think, look what we can do on top of our, uh, in our little computer box. I actually don't think you're as anti-statist as, as you just uh, maybe express if somebody took that, um, mm-hmm. you know, that, that sound clip out is I think this, another way to put this and guys, we're coming out with an episode on liberalism, the protocol mm-hmm. of liberalism on right. Monday it's not necessarily anti-status. It is anti-authoritarian, I think. Yes. And this is yeah. this is liberalism protocol preserving. So property right. rights, yeah. censorship resistance, freedom of speech, you know, those things and the amendments in the Constitution that mm-hmm. we set up our democratic republic protocols right. with. It's this that is, kind of technology. This is a new institutional form factor. It's so awesome. I know. 
It's awesome. I like that you pulled that out. I didn't know what you were going to say on, on that image, but um, that's, you know, way cooler. This is, this is the part too. two of this tech, of this take actually. So it continues. So you'll, you'll be happy to hear. So here's a take from tycoon.eth. When your ETH validator gets chosen to build a block, you got to step back and appreciate one of the greatest miracles of open source coordination and collaboration. For 12 seconds, your tiny machine in your bedroom is responsible for carrying on a network at work worth billions of Dude, billions of dollars. That's so cool. It's so awesome. It's so it awesome. It is. Uh, <laughs> wow. That's why That's why I am in this community, David. That's why I'm in this industry. This yeah. is. I really believe in this technology as a force for good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. You got a take too. Let me read David Hoffman's take. Bankless is an AI alignment podcast until further notice. <laughs> Track record so far. Eliezer Yudkowsky, 99% chance of doom. Paul Cristiano, 50% chance of doom. I just recorded with somebody's Nate Twitter name. is his name. At, uh, Miri. He says mm-hmm. there's a 95% chance of doom. Oh, that's bad news, David. Yeah, that's not good. 95% chance? Yeah, the, this is the, the guy executive that works director with- of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, he's at 95%. He works with um, Eliezer Dukowski, yes. so I expected yes. he'd be in like the 80s yeah. to 90s, but 95% isn't awesome. Yeah. Um, and then you finish it with this. Want ETH to hit 10K? We got to solve AI alignment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think we can hit 10K before that, but you know, what's the good <laughs> of your 10K ETH if the robots come and destroy it anyway? Right, right. yeah. I think that's the take here. So what, what did you want to say about this? Um, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, our hands are, are, what's the word? Our hands are forced. Like, what's the point of doing anything else if we can't solve AI? Alignment? Why are we giving this one more uh, special attention? There's all sorts of existential threats, right? There's nuclear it's the proliferation, there's threat. biotech. Why do you think it's, that? It, it's, it's, one order, it's one level, one dimension higher than all of other existential, it's the meta existential threat because it can cause all the other existential threats to happen. Or not happen. I kind of agree with this. And the other thing is, if we get it right on the good side, it mm-hmm. starts to solve all of the other existential right. threats. Okay. Potentially. <laughs> no, not just potentially. So that was actually, uh, so I'm here in uh, Montenegro doing this whole like network stake thing with a bunch of um, different uh, experts from different corners of the uh, of the world. And so Nate, I was talking to Nate, just uh, the longest interview. I usually do 20 to 40 minute min- interviews while I'm out here. I did uh, over an hour with him. The last question and the last point that we, the point of things that we talked about is like all of the doom that these people feel. Cause I, I, I started to get into the, the personal. I was like, okay, dude, like, how do you wake up in the morning? How do you keep going when you, when you are at 95%? I'm glad you doom? did that. I'm glad you right. got into that, by the way. And so that, that was the end of it. And he, and he just talked about like, I, I had my same thing with Eliezer, dude. I had my cry and then picked it up and I kept on going because what else am I going to do? I'm going to solve this problem. And then I did the whole like bankless internal optimist thing. Because, you know, we're optimists. And I'm like, okay, well, understanding that there's a 99% chance of doom, that we can't solve AI problems, it's, it's Terminator, it's, it's the worst, it's hell, it's all bad, we all, we all get our atoms repurposed, all, all the bad stuff that is the apparently likely, most likely outcome for the AI alignment problem. Under the conditions that we do solve AI alignment, and I'm not saying that we know how to do that, but under the assumption that we do get there, we do through th- thread that very small needle, it's not just like, oh, phew, we solved AI, AI alignment, we're not dying. It's actually all of the evils that we are trying to avoid invert. And they go from evils to positive because we fix AI alignment. And so it not just goes like, oh, no, phew, we're still, we still get to operate society. Society starts to become literally perfect. It becomes a utopia. It becomes heaven. Because we solved AI alignment and because we are working with them and they are producing the heaven that we want. And so like maybe the 99% is bad, but the 1% chance that we solve AI alignment is so good. That You're telling me there's a chance. There's No, I'm not telling you that there's a chance. I'm telling you that if once we, if we do get through that chance, the other side of that chance is so cool and awesome because the AIs are doing cool stuff for us, alongside us, shoulder to shoulder with us, that that is, should be motivating. And it, it, it cancels out how, how bad the 99% is. And so I don't know if it that's, cancels that's it out for me, but I think it's, it's definitely the stakes are, like we don't often talk about the other side of this if we do get it right. I mean, right. all of our episodes have been doomer, but like I think it can solve a whole bunch of the existential problems that are outside of the category of AI. Not just a whole right. bunch, all of them. It's all, it, that's, the whole cool, that's the cool thing. It solves every problem. <laughs> Is that what you're bullish on this week, David? I think I saw that. Is this what you're bullish on? AI, crypto? T- tell me about what you're bullish on. 
Yeah. So uh, actually, that goes back to Rocket, Rocket Pulser's question. Uh, yeah. And that that topic. I am bullish on all of a sudden this AI alignment problem is going to like sweep the world slowly but surely. We're front running the opportunity here at Bankless with this. Eventually, everyone's going to be talking about this because we're going to be faced with the problem. Crypto is going to provide some tools and some like like time stamping, like proof of humanity, like all of this stuff is going to provide parts of the solution we need to live in an AI world. And it starts to go, it's going to start to legitimize crypto because we've been thinking about these problems for the last decade and Web2 has not and nation states have not. We are creating future technologies in crypto that we need to live in an AI world. And we've been building them for a decade now. And so we, as an industry, are the most prepared to help humans live in a post-AI world. And that is going to be extremely legitimizing. And so AI is going to come in and then people will be like, okay, that crypto thing, we kind of need those guys. Um, <laughs> thanks for building the identity stuff. Uh, and that's that's what I'm bullish on. Oh, I'm also bullish on uh, it, prescient bankless listeners will notice that it's a different time in the day from the last pre-sponsor break. That's because we had to pause the... Uh, Pause the episode, go do like three meetings and then come back because Ryan and I are super busy. In that amount of time, I bought one of the uh, NFTs from earlier, the Madlass hey, I was talking about. You, so, you did Solana. You did the Solana I touched Solana thing. for the first time. I bought, uh, uh, so here's here's my little dude. I try to get one that looks like me. Is it, is, did I get good enough? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah? So this is a Mad Lad. This is a Mad Lad, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's good. There cool. you go. That's also, I'm, I'm now bullish Mad Lads and I own one. So that's David is now a Solana bull. I'm now so, a Solana uh, Maxi. Eat that, eat the Maximalist. Sorry, <laughs> <Yeah>. he's turned. <laughs> Susana, Susana's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> okay, Ryan, what are you bullish on? Um, I am bullish that we won't go the way, that the US won't go the way of China in terms of banning crypto. We're already seeing like Europe do something that was much more measured with Mika. That's great. But like actually reflecting on the hearing, the grilling of Gary Gensler last week, crypto has a lot of friends in Congress pretty surprised, right? Patrick McHenry, Tom Emmer, um, these people, maybe they, hopefully they care about Western liberal values. They care about things like free speech, but even if they don't, maybe they're just doing this for the money or whatever. Crypto also has some of that too, like votes and dollars. And, um, so I'm bullish that we won't go the way of China. And I'm also bullish that we have a court system that can check nation state regulators and powers, I don't know if this works in all the countries around the world, but the fact that a uh, company, an entrepreneur, can effectively sue the SEC and Gary Gensler, and that there is another power, a higher power in the court system, a check and balance on a regulator that wants to completely quash this industry. That's another bullish signal. Um, I also think that we can win the court of opinion, right? So you heard the Br- Brian Armstrong's like, hey, I started the company, the entrepreneur. I decided to locate it in America. What what Gensler is doing, he's driving this out of the U.S. How is it fair? How is it fair? How 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 can you be called a credible uh, regulator of securities when after seven years you don't even know? You can't even tell us. You won't give us the clarity on whether ether is a security or not. It's not that freaking hard. In fact, we saw those clips earlier. Gensler it knew it was a commodity in 2018. Like it was obvious, and now he can't tell us. It's a commodity. I think we win that battle in the court of public opinion. And I do think like in a democracy, hopefully that's what the U.S. still is. It has, has that, that semblance. It calls itself a democracy. That will matter as well. And so I think we win there too. So winning in, winning in Congress or early stages of like turning the ties in Congress, court system check and balance. I think we can win the court of opinion as well. So all of this to say, you know, this has almost been the year we've been talking so much about regulators in 2023, mm-hmm. and it's all because of the backlash of SBF and Do Kwan and Mashinsky in 2022. And I get it, but I feel like I feel like we've seen the worst. I don't want to say it's the bottom; like there could still be some things in Operation Choke Point that are happening. But I'm starting to see um, blue skies ahead and the tide turning a little bit. And I don't think that this ends with kind of a you know, U.S. ban on crypto or some disaster right. scenario. Yeah, I think that's right. And when we were doing our ledger show, uh, the State of the Nation we did yesterday, the chart show, uh, we had, for a brief moment we were talking about how, like, you and I got very bullish on Ether in the 2018 to 2020 bear market. And it was it was perhaps one of the most contrarian things that you and I will ever do with our lives. 
was be bullish ether in that time frame. And like one thing I mentioned in that show, and it may, I've been reflecting on it in the last like day or so, was that I haven't been able to feel that level of contrarian uh, since. Because like, well, if it was easy to be contrarian at $100 ether. It's not, it's 20 times less hard to do it at $2,000 ether. But like reflecting on the current state of the world right now, Gary Gensler and the SEC, John Oliver, just like public opinion about crypto and NFTs. Everyone like crypto, crypto is dead. NFTs are scams. Uh, we don't need crypto. Uh, upon reflection, it actually is, uh, once again, very contrarian right now and makes it feel very safe because we know crypto is not going anywhere. We need, they, they don't even understand how AI is going to come force their hand and make them use crypto. They don't even know that. We know that. That's why we're here. That's what we're doing. Yeah. I, I agree. It doesn't feel quite as contrarian, but it's still like right. uh, it, the age old trope, but we're still early. Can I say that without saying yes. cl cliche and dumb? Right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah, still yeah. actually true. We're still early. Super early. Uh, guys, to prove that, we have a, a meme of the week a combination, moment of zen for you. The normies won't understand this, David. Uh, Balenciaga. If Balenciaga met crypto, that's what you're about to see. It's super weird, but I hope you it's stick around. Super weird. <laughs> do you want? I'll do Podcast the risks and viewers disclaimers. Won't get it. <laughs> <laughs> risks and disclaimers, of course. Crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. There's only crypto and fashion, and fashion is Balenciaga. you're not wearing Balenciaga, you will get liquidated. Crypto is risky, but we're headed west, dressed in Balenciaga. Balenciaga.